I'm going going live. Okay. I'm going on mute. Okay. So <clears throat> today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19 transmission. Let me uh, pull this up. Clyde, just to confirm, I'm, I'm live and you can hear me. Is that correct? Uh, sh by now you should. Oh, yeah. Yep. You're live now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a, an interesting uh, issue and an important issue for us. You know, if you go back and you look at the other coronaviruses that have come out over the past couple of years, MERS and um, SARS, both of which, by the way, um, appear to have come uh, from the bat population. In other words, bats were the, and are, still are the primary host for those viruses. If you look at um, COVID-19, um, bats are the, um, are the primary host as well. Man is a what's called a secondary host. Um, and uh, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, MERS and uh, SARS, again, did not spread, already did not spread like uh, this one did. And so that's the, one of the key issues here. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover a little bit of what we covered uh, a couple of days ago but mostly focus on transmission. Um, <clears throat> we've got new clusters that have come out, uh, a lot of new clusters over the past 48 hours since we talked about this uh, on Monday. Uh, early contact tracing has been elusive. What does that mean? It means like, you know, the first uh, case in the US in Kirkland, Oregon, I mean, Kirkland, Washington, uh, there was no known uh, contact back to, uh, to China originally. And as you can see on the current map, um, there have been several other cases now reported uh, in Kirkland, and uh, we're beginning to see it um, grow in the U.S. One of the key issues here is asymptomatic transmission. We'll talk about that a couple of times over the next few slides. Pardon the, um, the fact that this image is uh, covering the, the last item. Uh, again, a lot of last minute preparation for the uh, presentation today. So here's the thing, there's uh, obviously uh, co coronavirus, COVID-19 version, has had significantly more uh, transmission than the previous ones. So <clears throat> before I go any further, let me clarify a, uh, a terminology issue. Uh, it's actually 2019 NCoV, or also called SARS-CoV-2. Those are the actual names of the virus. I keep referring to COVID-19. Technically, COVID-19 is the, um, the name of the disease itself. I'm going to continue to do that because when people hear 2019 ncov uh, they tend not, uh, it does not tend to ring bells yet. Same with, with SARS-CoV-2, that's still not a um, clear part of the uh, used terminology for a practical basis at this point. So again, I'll continue to refer to it as COVID-19. So as you begin to look, this was the, uh, the picture from the Hopkins interactive map as of what, about an hour ago? As we see, we're up to 89,000 uh, cases, 3,000 deaths, and you'll, I'll show you the picture from two days ago or 48 hours ago, and you'll see that we've got significant uh, coverage in the uh, uh, other parts of the world. So what has happened is it, you may be not seeing, you may not look like it's, you're seeing as much red, but there's clearly more cases. And what's going on is instead of focusing on uh, Asia and Europe, now the, um, the map by de facto coming into it shows the, the whole world because we've got, as you can see, clusters getting started uh, throughout the world. Uh, mainland China is still the biggest one uh, at, um, uh, at uh, 80,270. Uh, 80, uh, the total number of cases, by the way, has gone up from what, 89,000 to 94,000. 
the total deaths has gone up to, uh, or from 3,048 to um, um, 3,214. Uh, 3, so again, continued growth. And I think the, the uh, yes, there's growth in a number of cases, but there's clearly growth in the, uh, the biggest dimension that you see is gr growth in terms of the number of clusters. Now, there's one other point I wanted to point out. If you look at the bottom right hand corner, uh, this orange um, area is uh, mainland China. And right about here, uh, late January, you see a bump. Um, and that was a, unless I'm mistaken, that's when they changed their diagnostic um, uh, technique, I believe. And somebody fact check me on that. I believe that's when they started going with a, uh, a chest CT to make the diagnosis. So communication and, and uh, spread of the disease, that's the major topic I was gonna talk about today. Um, again, a quote from the CDC site, spread is thought to occur mostly from person to person via respiratory droplets among close contacts. Close contact can occur while caring for a patient, including being within approximately six feet or two meters of a patient for a prolonged period and having direct contact with infectious secretions, sputum, serum, blood, respiratory droplets. Now I got a, uh, some of the, the, you know, anytime you get on YouTube, you gotta be ready to get a lot of hater comments. And I got a lot of, it looked like the majority of my hater comments had to do with two things. Number one, referring to the CDC. So evidently there's some CDC haters out there. And number two, uh, my comments about reliance on the N95 mask as opposed to the um, hand washing. And I will deal with that uh, comment a, again in a few minutes in a couple of slides. But let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, spreading. You've, you've heard the term super spreader. I've never heard that term in terms of uh, dealing uh, as a professional uh, who's done a lot of outbreak uh, disease outbreak uh, investigations. Uh, we'll talk about what that is in, in just a second. But first, let's talk about the, uh, the uh, new case index. So every time, you, let, first of all, let's define the term generation. Every time you go, f one person infects another, the first person was in the, in the previous generation, the second infection is in the new de uh, generation. Um, a, term often called a transmission index is how many new cases on average will a case infect. With this one, this is relatively high. It's 2.6 compared to much, much lower uh, numbers, obviously with uh, Ebola by the time we started getting control of it, uh, MARS, SARS, all of those by the time we started getting control of them dropped way below one. And if it drops below one, the epidemic is going to by definition, just mathematically and logically uh, decline. Obviously, that's not what's going on right now. Um, and there are a couple of uh, questions that come up. Well, then why are we seeing more spread? Uh, one of them has to do with an asymptomatic carrier status. And that's perhaps, I think, one of the biggest issues for COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> now, why do I put those two things together? Quite often, they are the same thing. Uh, quite often, you, when a disease has a, an asymptomatic yet infectious stage, that's when you tend to get problems. You see that with the flu, you see that with measles, you see that with the childhood diseases, uh, you see that with um, other diseases that um, have and routinely have in the past and or routinely caused significant uh, epidemics. Um, if you're a, a virus or a disease, you're far better off um, not causing a lot of symptoms, but yet being infectious. In other words, the ability to spread. The classic example, which most people have heard of, especially most ba baby boomers, was typhoid Mary. Again, somebody um, fact check me on that, but I believe typhoid Mary was a lady named Mary who was a household worker, a domestic worker, and I believe it was in New York, New York at about the time that the cause for typhoid was being discovered. She uh, ended up infecting several um, 
members of more than one family uh, as she went from family to family. She was, um, she had a salmonella typhi infection. Salmonella typhi is the name of the bug that causes uh, typhoid. And uh, although she was not having symptoms or problems with the disease, she was clearly spreading it. Now, there's another question, and it's very interesting. Um, and that is, are cases reinfecting? Now, the bottom line is, I don't think so. But it's so weird. I saw this yesterday in a couple of um, videos that I was watching. The video actually appeared to be labeled on the iPhone as a WHO video. As I went back and investigated further, it was actually a, um, is it C Chinese? Is a Chinese government uh, supported um, thing? CDN Chinese CGTN uh, Chinese government television network or something like that. And they were talking about people that had had infections, had been uh, had full disease, were fully quarantined, um, and then came back and had uh, had gotten reinfected. That struck me as weird, um, not because it doesn't happen. It's not very common. Uh, most diseases, especially mo most viral diseases, do not, uh, once you mount an effective immune response, uh, you're immune to that virus uh, for the future. That's not always the case, and that would be a big issue. One of the reasons I'm, I'm focus on, focusing on that as we're talking about transmission is that would become a significant issue uh, for uh, us humans uh, in terms of trying to deal with uh, this uh, pandemic. So I, I saw that in more than one video, more than one were labeled WHO and then, but again, as I went back and dug deeper, I've never seen this kind of mislabeling. I, I don't know what's going on. I tried to verify that through other uh, sources. And I have to tell you, I am very skeptical that there's any significant uh, known uh, reinfection of known cases at this point. Obviously, again, it would become, it would become a significant issue uh, in terms of uh, uh, control if, um, if that were the case. I think the, at the end of the day, uh, what we're seeing is, again, the first issue that I talked about, not so much um, people getting reinfected, but the um, asymptomatic transmission. Now, why do I think that? Again, I go to, uh, I go to directly to the home sites of, of organizations that are investigating this. And again, I know I get a lot of haters and criticism for going and depending on the CDC site. Guys, they're good. Uh, they, they're, they've got the resources they, well, I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna say that. I know there's political arguments about whether or not they have the resources they need. They've got more resources than other organizations to deal with this issue and they've got a lot of talented people there. Um, you go back to the CDC share site, uh, share facts, and those have not changed. Share fact number three is someone who has completed quarantine or has been released from isolation does not pose a risk of infection to other people. So uh, until and unless I see significant evidence uh, otherwise, um, that's where I personally, um, my opinion is going. So uh, as I said, get a lot of haters for referring people back to the C CDC home site. Haven't gotten a lot of haters for referring people to the uh, Hopkins site, uh, that interactive map that I showed earlier. But again, both of them are excellent. Just to repeat through some of the share facts, the disease can make anybody sick. It's not just uh, any ethnic group. Uh, the risk of COVID-19 uh, is, it's currently low, but it's increasing significantly. Uh, we're starting to change what we're doing on a personal basis. For example, we're going out to eat less and uh, going into crowds less. And Janice flew back from Orlando earlier, so she didn't need to be flying through the Atlanta airport uh, two weeks from now as this problem continues to grow. Uh, you can help stop COVID-19 by knowledge, signs and symptoms, uh, simple prevention items, washing hands, and when you wash hands, most if you watch people 
when people wash their hands, they'll usually just pass their hands under some water. They may not use soap. They may not use water. They may not uh, quite often not even wash their hands. But take the time, take the effort, use soap, use water, do a full 20 seconds. And um, then you may ask me, so why am I focusing on that? Um, <clears throat> this, is an, this is a disease that focuses on the lungs. So therefore it's aerosol droplets. And again, so therefore a mask should be the most important thing. That's the other thing I got a lot of criticism about. Even for aerosol type of um, uh, transmission, uh, the major transmission for these things tends to occur when stuff gets aerosoled uh, or it, uh, it gets on people's hands and you touch surfaces. So again, focus on that point. Stay at home when sick, cover your mouth and nose uh, when coughing or sneezing. Um, I'm gonna skip over that and actually uh, go back out. Did not mean to, uh, to cover a full hour today, just wanted to give a brief update on that item. Now, let me see if I can actually pull up. Okay, so we do have some questions. Bart Robinson, just got the email alert. Excellent, looking forward to listening. Thanks, Bart. Uh, thanks for doing this, Doc. You're very welcome, sleeping dogs. Uh, Maya Abraham, the doc in Wuhan who died got infected again and died. Uh, again, I know, like I said, um, there's a, a lot of folks out there, especially in the Chinese government right now that are saying, this may be a re there may be some reinfection risk. I'm not seeing it yet. Obviously, I'm looking and um, if and when uh, that appears to be the reality to me, I'll certainly report that out. Paul Gagne, good morning, Doc. According to Wim Hof, his, his method guards against catching viruses. Have you checked out his vids? I have checked out Wim Hof's vids. Anything that improves your, um, your immune system can improve uh, your ability to fight viruses, but nothing helps like hygiene. If you're not exposed to the virus, that's a heck of a lot better than having a, uh, a strong immune system. If you look at the cases that uh, we've had so far, again, these are people that have some damage to their immunity, uh, one reason or another. They're a smoker, they're, they have diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes, um, uh, heart failure, all items which tend to decrease your, um, uh, your immune function. I'm gonna do a technical, uh, well, no, I'm not. I thought I was gonna be able to pop out that, um, the comment section, but that didn't work. Farrakh Farr, Dr. B, I live in Iran and people are falling left and right. In here, the mortality rate is about 20 to 30%. I haven't left the house for 10 days. Can vitamin D have an effect? Well, uh, vitamin D does appear to help in terms of several items, uh, especially in terms of prediabetes. So yes, I, I think Vitamin D clearly helps. The question is, uh, would it help for COVID-19 significantly? I think the major thing is continuing to do the hygiene stuff that you're doing, staying isolated, keeping yourself from exposure to the virus. Louis Tresco, thank you, Tony. I need so much help with, well, dear Farak uh, from Maya Abraham, are the young and fit dying or only others with other medical issues, the old? So um, as you, most of us know, the major focus on this disease, uh, some disease, some of the flu uh, diseases, for example, have hit uh, young people as well as old. Uh, most of them hit uh, older folks. And so far, this one has uh, not hit young people, not hit infants. It's uh, clearly not hit young adults so much unless they have immune problems. So have faith, good morning all, come in. Kevin McCord, good to see you, Kevin. Greetings from your friends in Northern Kentucky. Thank you for doing this session today, we appreciate it. Okay, um, that is it. I really didn't expect to do a lot of uh, Q&A today. Um, I will go back, for those of you who haven't uh, seen some of the issue, I will go back and cover some other uh, information in this space, talk a little bit more about um, 
the um, wet meat markets, some of those things that I covered on Monday. Uh, if you have, if you saw the, the video on Monday, you may want to just go ahead and tune out. Um, Clyde, let me set up a share to uh, go back in if we could. Okay, Doc. Oh, while you're at it, we've got one question from NW Frontier. Uh, okay. He asked, would IR be considered a medical issue? IRB? Oh, yeah, IRB. Oh, oh, oh would IR, insulin resistance, be considered a medical issue? It's clearly a medical issue. And again, um, insulin resistance is one of the, uh, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes is one of the risk factors for death from this disease. And, and why is that? Again, it's because um, it tends to decrease our immune response. Uh, hope you're healthy after traveling to Orlando. I am, thank you for asking. Um, garden, good garden of peas. If a young healthy person, 28 years old, has a bad respiratory thing two weeks ago, is there anything, any point in being checked now to see if it was uh, COVID ID? Um, I, it would depends on where your, your location. Obviously, if you were in Iran or China, uh, it might be helpful. I, I don't really know, even for those places, that it's going to make a, a significant difference now. Um, it may help in terms of uh, case tracking. Um, Northwest Frontier, could uh, COVID-19 trigger a heart attack in someone with insulin resistance? Um, here's of course it can. What it does, the here, if I can go into the, um, back into my slides, uh, I will, which I'm struggling to do right now. For some reason, Clyde, my, uh, <clears throat> my, um, mm, my share is not coming up. I wonder why that's, if I could get that share up, I would show you how uh, COVID covers the, here we go. I think maybe this will, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so part of the question was, how do you cover, uh, or can it cause a heart attack in somebody with insulin resistance? I'm gonna go back in and uh, bring up some slides which show a little bit about what COVID does. Um, great. Uh, let me go in. So if you look at the lungs, the lungs are, um, this is an alve this is a, these are alveoli. They are the tiny sacs of air um, where you get transmission of oxygen uh, from the air to veins. This blue line is veins and the red line is uh, turning back into oxygenated blood. Um, <clears throat> now here's what happens with uh, SARS, happens with COVID-19, happens with any of the um, uh, the uh, adult respiratory distress syndromes. You get inflammation. You remember we talked about inflammation a few times. Inflammation is where your body is attacking uh, something and you're getting friendly fire. So you're getting uh, inflammation where um, the um, body is attacking the virus. It's creating a lot of, of fluid impact. Fluid starts to uh, come around these alveoli and that fluid pressure starts to push in on them. That is what creates the problem which uh, can cause death with uh, COVID-19. Now um, <clears throat> they've done some things to figure out how to deal with people with um, acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome, which this is, and which again is the usual final common pathway for death with COVID-19. They've found out that, look, we intubate the patient. We begin to uh, force air into the alveoli, and that helps. They still uh, realized and learned a few other things, too. They learned if, if we 
force the force the entire breathing or tidal volume, that tended to cause shear stress in here. So they decreased the tidal volume. They also found out that um, humans tend to fight it if we're not getting enough um, breath or tidal volume. So they need to uh, actually paralyze the patient to slow them down so they don't fight uh, that um, ventilation effort. The other thing they found is if they, instead of lying on your back, they turned the patient over on their stomach uh, that had a huge improvement in survival rates. So then you go from uh, death rates in the 40%, 50%, um, down to 30% with those th first two items, and then even down to 16% with the second. So uh, why go into that? Again, the question is, if I have insulin resistance, um, so as you see, insulin resistance is an area where we get decreased ability to uh, fight um, uh, viruses, any of the immune activities. And um, so then you get increased um, uh, fluid while your body is trying to fight off this virus. Let me go back out and uh, deal with a couple of other things. Um, So any advice for prepping vegetable produce? I'm at, I have to tell you, what we have done, we're, we're, uh, we've purchased, um, we're not, I'm not focusing so much on fresh vegetables. When I'm visiting, my mom visited her last night and I uh, did not want to go out to eat. Uh, that's probably the last time we'll go out to eat for a while. Usually when I go out to eat, I tend to focus on the salad bar. That's a bunch of uh, uncooked food and it's more of a buffet style. Um, we're not, we're headed into a phase uh, personally where we're not doing so much of that. Um, I've always uh, tended to get uh, bags of fresh vegetables from the grocery store and again starting to slow down on that. I don't think there's any significant risk there currently but um, I'm going to canned vegetables. So canned green beans, uh, other canned vegetables, they're not as good as fresh, they, they're not as fun and in some ways they're not as healthy. But Here's the issue right now when we're getting into uh, to this mode, I'm uh, doing less uh, fresh, ve fresh vegetables and more canned. Richard R., do you hear medications like ARBs, beta blockers, reduce lung function if you have pneumonia or uh, COVID-19? That's a great question. You do hear about things like ACE inhibitors um, having an impact, sometimes uh, maybe even a very positive impact. I think the um, the jury's still out on what those will do. Um, it's, it's clear that uh, the mechanism makes sense. I think what's not clear yet is the true evidence that um, that's actually um, happening. Maya Abraham, have faith. I read that being an ACE inhibitor gives you some protection. Yes. So I've read that too. And again, as I'll, excuse me, continue to scan the, uh, the data, the science, and provide the information that I get um, in there. Quercetin being tried in China, four doses per day. I ordered the anhydrous form from Swanson to have it ready if needed. Uh, that was from Todd Foster. Let me go back and uh, go to a couple of uh, other points. Again, as we said, um, the uh, mortality rate for this disease is uh, 2%. It doesn't appear to have changed. I've seen uh, rates reported as lo low as 1%, as high as 2%. To put that in perspective, the regu regular seasonal flu is 0.1%. And so far, as many people have said, well, the regular season flu has killed a lot more people than this, at least in America. Um, so why are we so concerned? Uh, I think I've already covered that. If you didn't, if you joined this meeting late, um, there's significant transmission going on throughout the world now, and it's an issue of uh, new clusters popping up globally. Now, if you compare that 2%, uh, even the higher end of the estimate at 2% to SARS and MERS, no comparison. SARS had a, uh, a, uh, a mortality rate of eight to 10%, and MERS had a mortality rate of 36%. Just a reminder in case you're just uh, recently dialing in, all three of these viruses, COVID, SARS, MERS are coronaviruses. All three of them uh, are originally, the main host is the bat. The 
humans are what we call um, um, oh gosh, I'm having a senior moment. Humans are not the usual host, and there's a term for that, and I'm blanking on it. Maybe somebody can fact check and help me with it. Now, uh, these caused a few hundred, a couple of thousand uh, deaths. Flu regular flu with a much lower uh, mortality rate is causing a has caused a lot more deaths. And again, it's because of the spread. Spanish flu was the same thing. By the way, those of you who uh, who have an interest in Spanish flu or some of, some of the historical perspective, Spanish flu probably, there's a good case to be made that the Spanish flu was not Spanish. It was the US, it was American and maybe came from a, uh, a farm in Midland America. So death rates, a few thousand uh, per year here with uh, regular flu, less than a thousand, a couple of hundred, a few hundred for SARS and MERS with much higher mortality rates. Spanish flu, 50, what, 50 million. Um, now, why so much higher for that? Because number one, it had that little bit higher uh, mortality rate than you'd normally see with the flu, but it also had that um, significant increase in uh, spread communicability. And again, you're seeing a combination much more like that with, um, with uh, COVID-19 right now. I'm not going to talk about bubonic plague. I'm not going to talk about uh, some of the other um, epidemics that humans have dealt with. Other than this, this fact, um, is this going to wipe out the species? I don't think so. Uh, we've had plenty of uh, of tougher cases that come through, like bubonic plague, uh, HIV. Again, one of the major concerns with HIV is that it's you you have such a prolonged asymptomatic. Um, carrier status. Um, as we saw, typhoid, uh, one of the major reasons for spread with typhoid was uh, like typhoid Mary, again, at that prolonged asymptomatic carrier status. With bubonic plague in the beginning, it wiped out in some places over half the population. And part of the reason was we did not understand how it was uh, transmitted. Um, it was we found when we found out that it was transmitted by fleas from a uh, disease that was endemic in rats. Endemic means that it was that's where that was the primary host. Uh, humans were just uh, getting the disease when they were uh, bitten by fleas that had also that had also bitten the rats. With each one of these, once we start finding out what the cause is, we start making uh, changes in how we. Um, how we can prevent transmission, and that's what creates success in managing uh, an epidemic, pandemic, uh, one of these problems. Uh, remember, we went through some of this uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Ebola. Again, there were several things that uh, were happening originally. There were some local cultural issues in terms of um, being very demonstrative with uh, family members that had died, and uh, that demonstration of um, of grief over family members re often resulted in transfer of uh, body fluids. And once we started realizing that was a big issue, then uh, we started shutting down a lot of things that that were causing transmission. We've already seen that. I think it was in Iran. I think there was uh, a, um, a cultural habit of demonstrating uh, uh, allegiance or reverence to uh, one of the religious uh, representatives and even licking or kissing uh, a statue. And I think that's recently been uh, outlawed now. Again, so we're starting to make some changes. Oh gosh, Clyde, I'm starting to have the same problem I had yesterday where we can't come back out of the presentation. Okay, so uh, let me see, do we have, have any other questions? We are now finding out the real numbers. We can't trust China. The Chinese government, I'm not going to go there. We, uh, well, actually, I will. Let me just make a comment about the Chinese government. I'm glad to see some of the changes that are occurring. Um, so here's what the, some of the situation that we've had up until recently. Um, in China, they had a they had a a custom of what we call wet market. You'd had had these um, 
uh, exotic animals, eating these exotic animals. Uh, three of these lo located right up here, bats. Yes, they, uh, there was a custom of eating bat soup. And as you remember, bats um, are the primary host for SARS, MERS, COVID. Uh, so not a healthy cultural practice. Um, these animals, uh, the, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on, somebody help me out. I'm blanking on the name of, uh, of this type of uh, cat and this one. This one's actually a, um, I covered both of those uh, and I, I'll, I'll cover them again in another slide. These are uh, animals that often eat bats, eat other uh, animals that uh, may have some exposure to um, to the COVID virus and the uh, coronaviruses. So you had the Chinese government actually, at least it appeared that they were encouraging some of this as a way of increasing um, uh, a way out of poverty for people to catch bats and sell them for soup and catch these uh, exotic animals and uh, snakes, for example, and um, create these wet markets. Uh, for a long time, by the way, as an epidemiologist, it's been very clear that uh, the WHO and other uh, participating um, public health organizations had set up and focused on having um, uh, surveillance sites all over the world, but uh, especially around China, because again, there were significant uh, uh, environmental issues that tended to uh, cause some introduction. I had always thought it was an issue of flooded rice paddies and uh, ducks and geese in the rice paddies, um, humans working in those flooded fields as well. So a lot of potential for transfer of body fluids from uh, swine, birds, and uh, humans. I didn't know until the uh, these past few epidemics, uh, coronavirus epidemics, the amount of um, uh, wild animal um, human interaction that was occurring. Um, again, you mentioned China, the Chinese government. It's very interesting. Ever since the uh, first, we, we heard a presentation on this recently. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, Americans, for example, have criticized the Chinese com communist government for being too much of a big brother. The reality is Chinese government has started that way way back in the uh, the dynasties, even with the very first dynasty. And um, hopefully the Chinese will start getting to a way of life where uh, government is not quite so much of a big brother. Um, the government was accused of encouraging wet markets, accused of silencing the first reports. But then on the other hand, they've made some significant mobilization. They built hospitals for thousands of people, uh, victims within weeks. They quarantined an entire city, Wuhan, 19 million. No quarantine has ever been accomplished at that level anywhere in the history of mankind. So CGTN, uh, you may remember I mentioned the uh, Chinese government television network. That's what I was trying to uh, remember earlier. So now, if you tune into CGTN, you'll see a story on life at home can be very good. What they're talking about with life at home is the fact that they've, they're basically shutting down entire cities the size of New York and provinces and telling people not to leave their home. So yes, I think all of us, uh, at least most of us over in the, in the West have criticisms for the Chinese government, but uh, they're making progress. Okay, uh, New Frontier, the bat virus mutated in pangolins. That was the, the animal that I was trying to find. Let me go back and um, show that pangolins. This is a pangolin on the left. It's also known as a, uh, I think a, uh, a scaled anteater. There's another name for it as well. Um, it's also been very, uh, what's the word, prized as exotic meat, especially in China, then grew to other places in the Middle East and Africa as well. This is called a civet cat. It's also, uh, its meat has been uh, prized in these uh, wet meat markets. This is a civet cat in the, in the wild. As you can see, it has snuck up to this house and is drinking out of a, out of a uh, water drainage pipe. 
this uh, civet cat has been uh, captured and is uh, awaiting slaughter at a uh, at one of these wild meat uh, wet markets. So um, Maya Abraham, I was reading insurance won't pay three thousand U.S. dollars for tests and another four and another four thousand U.S. dollars for quarantine. So just stay at home. Well, again. Um, this is like heart attack and stroke. Um, the best thing is to uh, to not get the problem in the first place. To start having to figure out testing and treatment after the fact is not a great thing. Uh, and Christine Buckingham says uh, pangolins are endangered. I uh, I hope this has been helpful. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out. Thank you again for your interest.